Park, it's the 87th Precinct podcast. This is the only podcast in the world dedicated to Ed McBain's 87th Precinct crime fiction series, the genre-defining novels that set the pattern for so much literature and film and TV storytelling from the late 1950s to the present day. Starting in 1956 with Cop Hater and ending in 2005, the year of his death, with the novel Fiddlers, McBain, which was a pseudonym of the author Evan Hunter, produced 55 stories in the 87th Precinct series. And today's podcast looks at book number 13, the last of these novels released in 1960, See Them Die. So to review the book, I'm joined by my usual comrades, uh, Mr. Morgan Brown. Hello. And Mr. Stephen Royston. Hello. And Steve-O's got a cough, so he sounds both husky and probably... Like Tommy Vance. Like Tommy Vance. <laughs> Look, find out who he is. But after our diversion into Japanese cinema with our podcast about the film High and Low and our jaunt over to India to review the Bollywood film Inca, we're firmly back in the mean streets of Isola. But before we get stuck in, though, a reminder that the podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, YouTube, and more or less everywhere. And that a review and rating is really appreciated and very helpful in us getting the word out, as is any comment or contribution you want to make via our Twitter, Facebook, or our new Instagram page, where you can find us by searching for Hark87 Podcast. Right, that's a scripted bit out of the way, so on with the usual nonsense. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hello. Sorry about that. I felt we had some orders of business that I always well, forget no, to do. It's, it's a, a mid-series resume. <laughs> yes, it is. Although this is not an atypical book by any means in the series, so you wouldn't start someone here and say this is typical of the series, would you? But should we put some context in? As I say, we're still in 1960, but we're in, this was copyrighted and I think released in December of 1960. Oh. So should we have a guess at what the Christmas hits were in America and the UK? What could it be? Pretty obvious. Well, Some perhaps the songs might not be obvious. But Cliff Richard. No, not quite. Chavos. Uh, did Elvis have um, something out at the time? Elvis had stuff out all the time, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Cliff and the Shadows were in the charts a lot, I think, at this time. They Some, certainly were. Because I think Apache was 1960, wasn't it? And that was huge. But Elvis was number one in both the UK uh, and in America with two different songs. Mm, not rockers, by any means. Wooden Heart? No, it's just after Wooden Heart. <laughs> it wasn't the German folk song <laughs> adaptation, Wooden Heart. I was just thinking that might have sounded slightly festive in a, a bizarre way, but yeah, I know apparently what you mean. not. Um, oh... What would come just after Wooden Heart? I'm not great on my Elvis, I M must admit. Long. <laughs> M- 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 <laughs> That's a terrible condition. You're both rich and dying. Oof. Well, in America, he was on the charts for six weeks with Are You Lonesome Tonight? Oh, of course. That was re- released in 1927 originally. Mm. So it wasn't a Elvis song by any means. It was, it'd been around for oh. years. It was a standard. Mm. And in the UK, he was the Christmas number one. He was there for eight weeks around that time for It's Now or Never. Nice. Based on a solo mio. Absolutely. <laughs> or just one cornetto, as it's known to a generation of, yeah. of people in this country. I wonder if that aired in America, that advert. I, I don't know. Do, I, I, Are cornettos called cornettos in America? I, I'd imagine it, name, America I has like a whole... Because certainly even in the rest of Europe, they had different names. Yes, that's true. Perhaps they didn't have just one cornetto. What does, what does that actually mean, a cornetto? Well, it, it's just cornet with an O stuck on the end to make it sound exotic. I'm yeah, guessing. it's just like like a ice cream cone, oh. isn't it? Basically, to make to make it sound like it comes from Italy and is more authentic, <laughs> where it probably comes from a factory in I don't know Wrexham, mm, something like almost that. Almost certainly. 1960. I'm, I didn't go madly into sort of films and things like that, but it's an important year for British TV, 1960. All right. Because it's the year, the first episode of Coronation Street aired. Oh. Mm. Which is still running now. I don't know if it's the longest running soap opera in the world. It must be. It can't it be is. far off. Got to be the Archers. Well, yeah, in yeah, terms TV, of radio. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of TV soaps, it must be, surely. So Ken Barlow has been on our television since 1960. Crikey. Indeed, yeah. I believe it was supposed to be just like a short run thing to start off with a few episodes and then it's still on now in whatever year this is, the mm. future. That's what this is, isn't it? Mm. Mm. For anyone who doesn't know Coronation Street, it's what they call a kitchen sink drama, which is obviously very popular in the 1960s with the sorts of 
gritty plays about teen angst and life in working class homes and things Absolutely. like that. And that's where Coronation Street started. And whether it's could be classed as kitchen sink drama now, I don't know. I think it's more pure soap. Yeah, I've only ever seen odd bits, but the bits I have seen have, have been particularly daft. There was definitely a, a short run where they had uh, the rock band Status Quo. Oh, yes. Thing, which was tremendous. Yeah, it's always had a humorous vein. It's not as miserable as East yeah, That's it. Example, There's always like a, a bit yeah. of levity in there. I, I, I gather Snoop Dogg's a massive fan. <laughs> <laughs> and it has asked to have a part written for him, but they, they've resisted so far, sadly. No, I missed Vic Reeves. He was in it as a character over the, over the last year, I think. I would have liked to have seen that. Anyway, Coronation Street, very important, even if you don't watch it. it yeah, you was... can probably extract some McBain links to uh, the, be, Coronation Street. There'll be, be so many people in it. Definitely. Yeah, I, I haven't looked into that, but I bet you you could. You, you won't be wrong. Whether it would fill maybe maybe half a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I could get someone. I, we know people who look really obsessed over Coronation Street. I'll see if I can find a tenuous link for a side pod. In terms of things that were happening to Ed McBain himself, the film of The Pusher came out. So that was a third of the, the 87th Precinct novels. Mm-hmm. And it came out in February 1960. And that's the first time Robert Lansing stars as Steve Carella. Amazing. Before the TV series comes out. Yeah. Have you seen that film? Or? I've not, and I can't get hold of it, oh, which right. is annoying. Because you'd think, because there's films of the first three books, oh. and you'd think that would make an ideal cheap triple bill yeah, disc someone would disc knock out DVD like a, set. A feature of, films. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's surely some company out there would be up for releasing some kind of five ninety nine yeah definitely bargain bin ah. i can't imagine the rights are very expensive that film also features john astin who played gomez adams who we did actually see in the tv version of king's ransom ah yeah see all these links that you've got there <laughs> And also the film um, Strangers When We Meet was released, which was an Evan Hunter book. Oh. And he also wrote the screenplay for it. That starred Kirk Douglas and Kim Novak. Ooh. And this is my favourite little fact for it. It was directed by Richard Quine, who also directed three Columbo episodes. Oh, oh my Lord. Including the fantastic Dagger of the Mind, where Columbo goes to London and has to solve a crime. <laughs> and he's like outside the Royal Albert Hall where I was last weekend, where I deliberately went to the Royal Albert Hall, not just because it's an important and interesting landmark, but because I thought Peter Falk has stood there solving the murder of a British actor. (laughs) Wow. And Honor Blackman's in that. I've never ever seen that one. Oh, it's ludicrous. Sounds like one to look out for, definitely. What kind of era? Like later? No, 70s one, I think. Oh, right. I think it's quite an early one. But anyway, Time magazine called the movie Strangers When We Meet pure tripe. (laughs) Fair enough. <laughs> Which, there's no shock that it was made, though. It was a very big-selling novel. Uh, oh. I saw a load of New York Times press for the novel, which was oh. like saying, we've sold 18,800 copies in the first three days. Wow. Booksellers are calling us up and asking for more. There'll be another 15,000. Clearly, the success didn't really translate into the film. Oh. But I've never seen it, so, you know, I've just got to take Time magazine's word for it. Mm. And there we go. That's some background. Quick facts about the book. It was released in hardback by Simon & Schuster. It was also in a permabacks edition later on. Perma, uh, permabacks, what am I talking about? <laughs> permabacks? Yeah. He's wow. always had a back. What you meant, but you sounded... It sounded like so a new... Yeah, it was just it was like, all right. Very some, authoritative. Something there. halfway between a paperback and a hardback. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Just one hard Laminated page. paperback. Well, yeah. Anyway. Do it. That might be a new market. Mm. Permabooks paperback edition, number 4229. The UK release was TV Boardman, hardback edition, in 1963. Now, the interesting thing was the first paperback edition of this in the UK doesn't come out until 1968, which is odd. There's no, there's no Penguin release, and there's not a pan edition until 1978. So it sort of doesn't really exist as a paperback in, until quite late on, mm. in the UK at least. When it comes out in a thing called Four Square Crime hmm. by the New English Library. So it's a bit strange that. It's a bit. I don't know if this is a pattern that happens with any of the other ones, but this one certainly seems not to have had much of an impact in the UK, at yeah. least. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it certainly is. I, I wonder why that would be, because certainly Penguin picked up on uh, more more of the uh, other ones from this era, kind of like. Yeah, it's quickly, a big long run they? of yeah. them. 
Uh, so that's very odd. Maybe they just felt the the subject matter wouldn't be as relatable to UK audiences or something. I have no well, idea. Well, I wonder about the subject matter of this book, which we haven't talked about yet, because it also there wasn't a version of this made for the 87th Precinct series. And I wonder if that was considered perhaps a bit too, not radical, but a bit too inflammatory, mm. the sort of gang aspect of this, maybe, mm. why they didn't make it, or it just perhaps doesn't translate. <clears throat> but I've got even more preamble stuff to say here. <laughs> Busy year, 1960. So, well, tell you, what, tell you what, Steve, you can read out this, oh. this next bit. Go on, with, go. Your, with your voice. Well, he has got voice. a cough, so the bottom so section. Where are we? Underneath the grid there. Underneath the grid, right, OK. <clears throat> so, a question from one of our Twitter followers. Uh, Andrew, at much ado about nil. Mm-hmm. Hello, Who Andrew. Asks, well, should I do a voice for Andrew? I uh, <laughs> believe that entirely up to you. Do we, do we think he sounds like Tommy Vance? <laughs> I don't Go think then. you have yeah. a choice, really, do you? I've never researched the genesis of each novel. <laughs> Any chance they were published in a different order than they were written? That's very good, actually. I ask because Halls has been non-existent in the last few books I've read, whereas he was a star immediately after his transfer. It was very true, actually. He suggests that the heckler sounds like a title from the early part of the series. All oh, interesting oh. points. Well, that is yeah. that is spot on, actually. Because the characters do... It's as though he gets obsessed with a particular character. Um, well, from what we, bit, some uh, of those forewords we've read where he said about the publishers wanting uh, someone new to come in, so he invents mm, Cotton Hawes as a character yeah. to take over as a bit more of the ladies' man. Yeah. But within a couple of books, he's basically given him a girlfriend anyway and sort yeah. of made him into a nice guy. I, I, yeah, sort. I suspect not, because <clears throat> um, in terms of him being out of sequence, because I think in, you'll, you'll notice later in the series, like Hal Willis isn't in it for about best part mm. of 20 years, is he? And then all of a sudden becomes one of the main yeah. characters for about three or four books on the trot. It, it is an interesting point, yeah, but I, I do think it's more down to just uh, the author's kind of whim mm. rather than whim. Uh, any sort of uh, out-of-sequence publishing. And, and I do take the point about the heckler sounding like it fits in with those earlier titles, but... It definitely does, I, I yeah. think that there are things in the story that, that may mean that it can't, be like that unless it was revised later but I well, don't think I, that's the I case. Well I found some some information thanks to a couple of forewords or in fact the afterword to this mm. edition of the heckler that me and you have got Morgan which is the Orion edition. Indeed. So in the afterword to the Orion edition of the heckler McBain says that he had the idea originated in 1959 mm-hmm. when some of the events of that book happened to his father-in-law who was getting crank calls. However he does say that bef- and I quote before I wrote the Heckler, 11 87th Precinct novels had already been published. Yep. So he wrote that in sequence. Oh, so even right, though it okay. sounds like, you know, the mugger, the pusher, the Heckler, it wasn't written earlier. It was written at the time mm. for when it needed to come out. Also, I think just because of the way it focuses on largely on criminals rather than on the, the, the goings on in the precinct, I don't know if you'd have had the confidence to embark on something like that earlier in the series when you're still establishing the kind of uh, setting and everything. Yes, very much so. Um, and perhaps it would have been a bit of a gambit to introduce or write a master criminal at, at some <laughs> Really early stage in your series when would you weren't have, sure it was going to be a goer. Would have been a bold move. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him. No. But I don't actually think it was the case in this instance. But, I, but it, is a, it is it's an a interesting fair question. point, though. Yeah, definitely. It is. Well, I did, I did check this. So Cotton Hawes appears in book five, and he's in book five, six, seven, eight, nine. He's not there in King's Ransom. He's back in the next one. He's not there in The Heckler, and he's not there in See Them Die. I should get my uh, big schedule updated, actually, which yes, is right. a visual aid for such matters. Definitely should. So Cotton Hawes is in and out at this point. Killer's Wedge, that was a story that McBain kept trying to adapt for the stage. So I don't know if that was a pre-87th Precinct thing or you just thought it was a good enough story to go on the stage. We did talk about that a little bit in the podcast. Mm -hmm. The Empty Hours, which is a story that is in a book that has that same name. It's a short story in a book of three, which comes out in 1962, was originally published in 1960. So this is where there's a little bit of time difference in when things come out. Because The Empty Hour was originally published in Ed McBain's mystery book, Number One, a magazine, in 1960. I didn't know these things existed. So Ed McBain's mystery book ran for three issues in 1960, and he was listed as the editor of it. The first one featured his story, uh, The Empty Hours. 
but it also had stories from people like Ross MacDonald, Anthony Boucher, Amazing. Lawrence Block, Donald Westlake. Wow. Loads of names oh, you'd yeah. recognise. And then in the 70s, there was a thing called Ed McBain's 87th Precinct Mystery Magazine. Oof. Which I don't think he actually wrote anything for. Well, no, he wrote for the first one again, I think. And so, that was another three issues of like it? stories by other authors. I say, I would have like subscribed on the name alone. Yeah. So the Empty Hours book is is just basically just he sticking in a novel his stories for that magazine, presumably. So yeah, of course, the Empty Hours the book has got th- is three short stories, yeah, isn't it? And so that one goes three. in there as one, and then there's two other ones in there. Oh, okay, yeah. But I didn't know anything about this magazine. No. Um, and that this turned up because I was trying to find out more about See Them Die, because I didn't think there was much to, to find. I was looking for stuff. But See Them Die was based on a short story that McBain wrote called See Him Die, mm. which was published in a magazine called Manhunt. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just did a hand action for no good reason there. And that was published in 1955. Wow. As an Evan Hunter story. So this book we're going to talk about is one that is based on an earlier mm. manuscript. And it's very different in the sense it's a short story rather than a novel length thing. But it does feature gang members. It features a shootout and a siege with an infamous criminal. But all the gang members and characters are Italian in that story. Whereas in this, we are transported to Puerto Rican communities. And there's a cop in it called Don Levy, who's a bit like Andy Parker from what you can tell. But it's all told from the point of view of the lead gang member. So this is one that he expanded and, and... built up on and it's available in a book called learning to kill which is a collection of his early works Ooh. which i only found out about the other day and ordered it hoping it would arrive today but it hasn't but it's on the way <laughs> more for the collection tremendous see that so there's tons of backstory for well, this. i started is, yeah. i started tugging on threads and why the, <laughs> the whole cardigan <laughs> <laughs> excellent we've got any initial thoughts on see them die Initial thoughts. Initial thoughts. No, no ratings. No, no giveaways about your particular feelings. But you know. Well, <clears throat> I was reading it again, and uh, yeah, it had stuck in my mind from first time round. Whereas some of the others, some do and some don't, mm. and this had really stuck in my mind. And yeah, I was really impressed second time round again, mm. and it is quite different. Um, and when we were chatting the other day, what struck me feels quite cinematic. I thought. Yeah. You, you could totally imagine a film of this. You really could. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, I suggested it does... a bit like Rear Window. You sort of closed, very sort of stagey, but very closed off, claustrophobic sort of sets and things like that. And it, Maybe. Uh, it throws out a lot of the usual 87th trappings, I would say. You know, the dead end cap. You know, there's no investigation as such in this mm. book whatsoever. There's no. a lot uh, less procedure than yeah, you expect the, in a police procedural. The, the, the police, you know, in the main, you just... Well, there's only one particular character who gets a real examination, uh, if you see what I mean. And the others are just there for their role in the, in the siege, mm. r- really. Well, t- two so police characters who uh, yeah, have, a, have a starring role. There's really. only one sequence in the station house, in the 87th Precinct yeah, station. And that's, uh, and that's very brief. Yeah. And that just serves to get them out onto, the characters out onto the street. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say cinematic. And, yeah, I think you're right in atypical. Uh, it's not yeah. a typical novel, but I was... I, I, I loved it, yeah. Oh, it, the one thing it, it was making me think to follow on for your point is that maybe there isn't quite such a thing as a typical 87th Precinct novel because we've, we've sort of... I was thinking back over past yeah. episodes and we, we normally find ourselves going, it isn't quite a typical know, novel. And, and I think that's one of the great things about the series. It'll have like little things that you know are always going to be there, like the little character introductions, the, the way the weather is kind of... Mm, in intrinsic maybe, part of the yeah. story, the little familiar things that will always make make it seem kind of a bit like it's it's something you 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 already you know, know it's in the canon. But it does so many different things with it, and it it does seem like certainly at this stage, I I, I don't know if if things get more formulated, but even when they even if they do, I don't think the series ever really settles into a, a pattern where you know kind of pretty much no. what you're going to get at, at any point. And I th- yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Perhaps it's just you just naturally think there's a bit of a 
a, a standard, but yeah, yeah. You, you're right. I, I, I think I meant that in terms of there's no investigate. There's no, no I'm, I'm investigate. There's no there's less driving the, around. Definitely less of the interviewing. procedure than you get in quite a lot of them. But I think definitely he does use the series just like a fairly loose framework to do yeah. pretty much whatever he wants, which I think is really exciting. But if we tried to, I'm sure we could list things that we would expect to see in each Absolutely, of them. And yeah. ma- many of those things would be absent in See That's Them true. Die, That's such true. as there's no uh, use of forensics, there's oh, no right, use yeah. of uh, like pathology, there's no reproduction forms or, or anything like that. Well, they're not even investigating a crime, are they? That's it, yeah. Uh, the entire book is about a potential the- forthcoming crime, isn't it? It's the conclusion and, of a manhunt, basically. And a crime that's manhunt. happened that we don't even... Oh, we have very, <laughs> <laughs> have very very little details about, isn't it? So it, mm-hmm. it's about what's happened and the consequences of that. And then with the gang and the other characters, what might or might not happen yeah. with them, really. In the, the... It's, it's Ed McBain's West Side Story. It is. I'd like, as much as like any kind of crime story, it's about a sort of portrait of a community as well. Which is is a really nice sort of change for the series too. But, but so. you, you, you could film this if you were going back to the film and I briefly discussed this the other day in terms of similarities with the likes of Rear Window. You, you could film this entire book with a one from, massive soundstage. Yeah, as with, with, with from two camera angles, couldn't you? Yeah, more or less, yeah. yeah. Almost, yeah. But one you, from the cafe looking out, one from. Looking at the building. But you'd still be cutting between different groups of, yeah. uh, of characters, so it'd still feel like the movie was shifting, even though... Yeah. Well, why not made a film of it? I've no idea, because um, unless, as you say, the subject matter was Well, I think because for... in 1960, gangs were sort of going on their... Not on their way out, but they were starting to deal with them a bit better, but they mm. had been really big. So there's huge moral panic about gangs, especially in New York. Yeah. And that's played out in... We've seen a little bit of it in some of the other books, but this is where it's most played out. And there's a few books later down the line that have it in as well. But it was a huge moral panic. And that thing about West Side Story is how a lot of people see it now, which is all seen as like a romance story. Romance and dancing. But that was all founded in really vicious, murdery gangs. You know, they'd had better names than the Jets and the Sharks in real life. I've got some of them down here in a second. Oh, so the main thing is it's set in this sort of Puerto Rican, um, the barrio, what becomes in New York, Spanish Harlem, basically, or was known as Spanish Harlem. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of a potted history of Puerto Rico in America mm-hmm. or New York. Nice. Let's go way back to 1508. <laughs> Spanish colonization begins in earnest. Uh, 1898, we've got to skip forward a little bit there. We have the Spanish-Cuban-American War. And in that year, United States acquires Puerto Rico. 1917, Congress says all Puerto Ricans can be U.S. citizens, which means immigration's easier for them. And then in the 40s and 50s, net immigration from Puerto Rico is 151,000. That's not all to New York. In the 50s and 60s, the net immigration from Puerto Rico is 470,000. So it shoots up the number of Puerto Ricans moving to New York in what they call the Great Migration. So the difference is, 1950, there's about 187,000 in New York. By 1960, there's 892,000. Mm. So it's huge. And oh. of course, like with the Irish, like with the Italians, they all end up in communities yeah. crammed in, pushing against the other communities. And that's where a lot of the issues come from. I will just acknowledge that I got those figures from a chapter in a book called Colonialism, Citizenship and the Making of the Puerto Rican Diaspora oh. by Carmen Whalen. I looked up the word diaspora. I used one of these words I learned at university and, and, and looked it up. And I found a, an article about gangs in New York. I've highlighted some of the gang names. So in, in Brooklyn, there were gangs called the Mau Maus, Jokers, the Bishops and Barons. You could do a... Uh, was Russ Abbott in that? <laughs> Is that? You could do a true or false on uh, gang names, couldn't you? you really It'd be could. impossible to... Well, you've also got the Fordham Baldies. The Andy Amazing. Baldies. And the Golden Guineas. The Fordham Baldies is American. I wonder if American, they're... Amazing. Have you ever seen the film The Wanderers? No, I haven't. There's no. definitely a, a gang in that called the Baldies. I, I'm guessing are probably based directly on that. It's like sort of American proto-skinheads. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Because it would have been quite 
apart from having a big long hair haircut, it would have been quite shocking to have a, a, like a, a severe buzz cut or a, a shaved head. In, in those days when the, the, the big shiny pompadour was the thing among yeah. the uh, teens. Well, they could have been fighting the dragons, the red wings and the Egyptian kings. Amazing. The jesters and the Amsterdams. So there's all these groups who were actually beating the living crap out of each other mm-hmm. or innocent members of the public if they felt like doing a show of strength mm. type yeah. of thing. Certain gangs were also known for their hats, <laughs> such as the beavers. Mm. Probably known for their woggles and neckerchiefs as well. <laughs> the tiny Tims wore blue berets. Excellent. Can you imagine that the only gang you can get in is the tiny Tims? <laughs> oh, dear. Bless. But you'll, you'll like this one. There was a very famous gang member who was famous for killing a a 15-year-old. He was called Salvador Agron, and um, he was dubbed Cape Man because he wore a cape. Wow. (laughs) There's a lot of... He joined a gang called the Vampires, donned a cape, and took to jumping out of the shadows to terrify passers-by. Tremendous. They got him, though. (laughs) But that's that's the background to the the book we've got Mm. here. So how do we deal with this book? It's... It's an emotional journey for the 87th Precinct reader, fan, yes. fan of goodies, like I am. So where do we start, really? We've got, as steve suggested, basically two or three places where you point your eyes in this book. And, yeah. and it is, one is a, a, a luncheonette. Time, yeah, cafeteri. Uh, cafeteri? No, <laughs> cafeteri. A cafeterium. <laughs> to the cafeterium. What's the word I'm after? Cafeteria? Yeah, one of those. Caff. Yeah. <laughs> a caff. <yeah>. Greasy spoon. <laughs> Imagine if it spent a cafeteria. Yeah. Can't you spend all the time in a cafeteria with a plunger. Yeah. But a luncheonette it's called in this, isn't it? Yeah, and it's run by an old yeah. an old Puerto Rican. And this is where a lot of the... Louis. Louis is his name. And a lot of the relationships between characters is played out in there. Oh, my voice is going as well. You're the one that's supposed to have the cough and I'm the one who sounds like they're going backwards through puberty. But that's a very interesting place because obviously places like that are where you get different people from different areas of life. And in this case, we have the gang members, all of whom are quite young. Yeah. 15, 16 year olds, I think, for the main part. Chatting through what they're going to may or may not do that day. Yeah, to another kid who they've decided touched up one of the girls that the gang leader thinks is his own girl. Even though... No, he didn't. Uh, as, 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 as we realise, yeah, she's not even remotely... You kind of know it. that from day one, you do. don't you? you do. It's kind of... But that's not the point as far as he's, he's concerned. He's literally a hothead, isn't he? A lot of uh, lud- a ludicrous um, uh, machismo, which I'm sure is um, a feature of, of gangs... Anywhere that they... Uh, well, a lot of this uh, gang stuff is about proving yourself, isn't Absolutely, it? It's about, yeah. it's about saying, I'm the one who did over that guy or got those yeah. guns or... Well, they look, they, they, look, they look down on... Well, certainly the um, the leader looks down on Louis, the, the cafe owner, as though, you know, total loser owning your own cafe. You know, who wants to do that kind of and thing? And anyone who's sort of not assimilated into sort of the American culture is also really dismissive. Mm. Why do you talk like that, he says, to the characters who don't have as good... Yeah. American accents or, mm. or, or um, speech as, as he does as well. But we also, in the cafe, we have one of our main driving forces for some of the... Well, it's not background story, but the the romance story, yeah. almost, yeah. which is our the sailor, sailor. The sailor. A sailor who basically rocks up into into the barrio looking... Drunk. Drunk, drunk looking to get laid in a... But it's 8.40 in the morning when he turns up. Mm. So he's clearly had a very long night. <laughs> he's like, how do I cap off this? Before, I, before breakfast, I think I'll go and try and get laid. <laughs> or pay to get laid. So he yeah, progressively sobers up, doesn't he, in the first few chapters. <laughs> uh, well, in the first part of the book, in the, in the cafe. and then. But he's, he's start... at heart, he's a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. He's from some Colorado or somewhere. Yeah, some, yeah, some it's little like town. Mid- Midwestern sap. Bless him. And he, he falls for this girl who it turns out is involved with the gangs. And there's this proper sort of ludicrous whirlwind romance of like, I want to see you. Okay, I'll see you after church. I'll pack a picnic type thing. Yeah. But I wonder whether we liked chicken. <laughs> yeah. Or oh, yes. yeah, yeah. But one of my favourite things, very... his name's Jeff, which, and she's sort of having these dreams of like, Jeff, what a wonderful <laughs> name. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Say it again, Jeff. <laughs> it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with the name Jeff. No. I just 
it's not like this rolling off the tongue exotic name. It's not. Maybe not, it is if your name's China. But, well, yeah, which is quite a foxy name, isn't it? You know. You just, yeah, it's sort of portrayed as such exotic. To our, our ears, the, uh, the 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 name Jeff doesn't necessarily ring with poetry, but uh... yeah. Jeff Talbot. <laughs> yeah, who's was the most? Yeah, but he's supposed yeah. to be normal, isn't he? You know, he's he's a he's a normal guy in sort of the extraordinary circumstances that being a sailor and on shore leave in a big city can lead you to. Mm. He's sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time. He's nearly in the right place at the right time if it had all worked out with a girl. But it doesn't... Oh, it's so tragic. It is, right Oh, there. it makes my little heart bleed. <laughs> but he, he kind of pans all, all right from in the end. Well, it about. ends the way he wants it to. At yeah, real, it, it ends as it starts kind of thing. Yeah, yeah he actually, goes off with the fat guy as well. It's quite nice, really, that, that McBain doesn't try and push this romance home to it to, to the conclusion the tragic, it, yeah. it, it's like it, it, it yeah it could could become quite cloying and unpleasant i think if, if it, it would never them. it would never have worked exactly. anyway well it? if you consider yeah. he's a sailor and he's not very old it doesn't right. say how old he is i don't think in the book but china is 16 years old yeah. so it's a bit of a strange one yeah. And I think a lot of this is about gang members trying to appear older than I thought they she are. Was, I thought she was a bit older than that, because wasn't that one of the... I, don't I know. think I've got her written down as being 16 years old in, on my little list. But. All right, okay. I, I had a feeling that she was slightly older, and that's one of the... Because Zip is the gang leader, yeah. and he's 17. Yeah, she. I mean, China certainly seems a lot more mature than any of the gang members, but I think yeah, Well, that's all the girls in this course, do, don't yeah. they? So all the girls in this book are a bit more... Not headstrong, I mean, a bit more forthright in knowing what's right and wrong. Mm. Even the, the prostitute characters are, are there. They're not shown as being criminals particularly. No. They're shown as, as using the situation the, the best way they can to get what they want and need. So it's quite an interesting look at the, the younger girls and these different types of characters as well, which is nice. I like the fact that Zip got his nickname, it's decided on his nickname because he used to be called Fat Ass Charlie. Mm. <laughs> You'd, you would, uh, you'd push for a new nickname, it, wouldn't you? You probably would, yes. If only I could have been called Jeff Talbot. <laughs> but it's a Sunday, it's July, it's baking hot, so you've already got that heat and, and mm. the closeness in the, of, yeah. of a city when it's like that. And yeah. in this, the uh, 87th, the itching to get hold of uh, Pepe the, Miranda. The, the fugitive. Yeah, so there's been a massive manhunt going on. For this chap, Pepe Miranda. Murderer and mugger. Murderer and mugger. He's a very ah. bad man. It's all compounded on the idea that if he's killed by the police, he might become a hero to these gang members yeah. as like a Puerto Rican... Not a bandit. What's the word I'm looking for? Sort of almost like a Robin Hood type character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they want to try and avoid making a martyr of him. But he holds himself up and there's a massive siege. And that's the other main part. That's the main cops bit of it. Mm. And they all turn up. Although prior to that, Andy Parker's out on the the sniff, isn't he? On the prowl, trying to find yeah. him. For, for the first time, really, Andy Parker, the most visible member of the 87th mm. uh, in this book, which well, is, is great for everyone. Yeah, see, uh, he's, I know we've chatted about him in the past a bit, and he's, you know, not... To pleasant whatsoever, but he makes a nice refreshing change because you get a bit sick of them all being so bloody <laughs> nice and reasonable, don't you? Well, on my um, little list of, of characters in the book, the civilian side is, is nice and long, but the, the cop side is really short. Oh. Carella's there. Him and Burns, pretty much, uh, isn't he? Peter Burns, yeah. Frick is Captain Frick's around oh, oh, just yeah. for a little bit of shouting through a megaphone. Yeah. Frick. But basically, it's Andy Parker and Detective Frankie Hernandez. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah Frankie Hernandez. <gasps> Without... <laughs> oh, no, no, that's a very... That was a, a pregnant pause, if ever there was one yeah. there, really. Before we get to that. I've, I've got a good character name on my list of characters, which is Woman with Parakeet. Excellent. There is a woman with parakeet in it. And the prostitutes who are called Marge and Marie. They're quite good. Oh, I like the big fat man. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. We're not being rude calling him a big fat man. That's how he's described, and he's quite happy with it in he his character description. He's at peace with his big fat madness. Also, he's fictional, so... so he gets there. snarled up in a traffic jam and then goes being a bit nosy, doesn't he? Because he's got it, nothing better to do. It's one of these great sort of, like, 
little uh, vignettes that like McBain's great at slipping in between all the tense bits to just sort of provide a bit of relief. Well, that's one of the ticks on the list of things you would expect, mm, isn't it? A, absolutely. A comic character. So this guy's called Frederick Block, a big fat man who gets, gets caught in this roadblock that's caused because of the siege. And he sort of gets out, gets in the cafe to says, what, say, what's going on? And the guy says, well, they're going to try and get this guy out. There's going to be a standoff. And he's like, oh, brilliant. I've never seen anyone die before. Oh, this is fab. I want to see, I want to see him get shot. And then the prostitutes approach him and say, uh, do you fancy a good time? And he's like, yep. <laughs> well, I'm not going, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> it's quite a funny scene, that. It is. And then he's like, how much? <coughs> never say 50. He's like, nah. Twenty, go on then. Yeah, <coughs> it's yeah, it's that's a. F- As though his days taken a very total diversion <laughs> from unexpected turn of events. So yeah, big fat salesman from Calms Point, which I think is Brooklyn in the real world equivalent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got some other little notes before we get onto the real drama bit of it though. So references in this book because he likes to throw some in. He references references. <laughs> he does the some. Reference. He does some references. He references the Breen Office, Warner Brothers, and Anthony Boucher. So the Breen Office I'd never heard of, but I have heard of the Hayes Code and how it relates to Hollywood, because that's the code that governs film censorship, or governed film censorship. So the sort of pre-code and post-code films, and some of those pre-code ones are a lot more dramatic and nasty than nastier than you'd expect. In I think that's sort of up to 1940s is is pre-code, and then after something like that. Anyway, but Breen, the Breen office. Joseph Ignatius Breen was the man who ran the, the Breen office, who applied these censorship rules. Great name. Tremendous name. Not yeah. enough people called Ignatius. What was these rules? Well, he was very, very strict. He sort like, of came from a strict Catholic background. Can't so. see a leg above a knee or that kind of... That's a, <laughs> can't get that on a T-shirt. That just sounds weird. Can't see a leg above uh, a knee. I mean a, I know um, a bare leg. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, it was all kind of... it was all that sort of stuff, and then you know portrayals of violence, portrayal of of racism, sexism, all that. Oh, so right. it was a, a funny one because that was a very evolving thing. But he was very much involved with that dramatic upheaval period in in Hollywood, where they were wresting sort of the, some of the control away from these people like Howard Hughes, and uh, yeah. who would go in their own way without any restrictions. So at one point, he was considered to be like the most powerful man in Hollywood because mm. he basically had the say on what could and couldn't be shown. He also referenced Warner Brothers. We know who they are. They are cartoon animals. <laughs> and Anthony Boucher gets a name check in this book, and he is the New York Times crime reviewer who was also a writer. Mm-hmm. I mentioned him before. He was in one of the mystery magazines. He reviewed this book, and he said, and this is sort of ties into what we were saying earlier, he said, McBain, fortunately, is not concerned with writing according to the McBain formula and can sometimes depart from it almost entirely. The latest novel is not a detective exploit of the 87th Precinct, but something close to a straight novel about life in the precinct, in which the police are among the characters. We could, uh-huh. we could be book reviewers, couldn't we? <laughs> we're, 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 well, we sort of are. We've hit the nail yeah. on the head. So he's got that impression as well. But that's nice for Anthony Boucher to be not only featured in Ed McBain's yeah. magazine, but a name-checked in the book as well. Nice. Because he's someone who, when I look at the reviews, he's a big obsessive of this. An early adopter, I think they'd call them, wouldn't they? Cool. Yeah, so that's that's my references list. But the rest of the book, really, the the thing that's affects us most is Frankie Hernandez, oh. mm. who we've only met a couple of times before, haven't we? Mm, yes, yeah, but I think so, yeah. And only one of those has he got a fairly significant role. Yeah. But, he, he's um, cro- cropped up a, a couple of times, and we've we've had like some dealings with him, and it's been fun, and he's caused uh, an entertaining flashpoint between Steve Carella and Andy Parker, mm. which he um, does in so this again, indeed. And that's perhaps why they only keeps it down to those three cops. I mean, Carella's fairly sidelined, mm. mm. apart from when he's asked to dress up as a priest <laughs> to go, and, which is a thing that happens to Carella because when he gets to fuzz to. later on, he famously gets into disguise. But he goes off to be to borrow the clothes of a priest in order to try and trick Pepe Miranda out of his bolt hole. <laughs> um, but Parker and Hernandez, Parker spends the entire time needling Hernandez about, well, he's your he's your brother, he's your people, isn't he? He's, he's one of you, Puerto Ricans. And Hernandez is like, oh, give over. <laughs> Not in so many words. Well, in more words, in fact. doesn't say, oh, give over, like someone from Middlesbrough might. Mm. So, Hernandez, 
Frankie Hernandez seems like a good guy. He certainly does. He's sort of bearing the burden of being the Puerto Rican detective because he oh. keeps getting sent out to be to he sort of rep, he does represent them to to the rest of the detectives. He becomes the unofficial ambassador. Is that the yeah, word I'm looking for? I think so. Liaison. Yeah, kind of liaison. Yeah. Knows yeah. he has to be like the community liaison, whether he wants to or not. Really, that mm. that's just kind of his lot. As, as a police officer, and he, he, he seems to bear it pretty well, even though, obviously, he would prefer to just get on with his job. But uh... And he's a nice guy. In this book, he goes over to talk to the the boy who's worried about getting shot. Yeah. And that's, he does that sort of thing. He'll go and talk to individuals. He understands it. And so when it gets to the siege and they need someone to try and take down Pepe Miranda in this, this plan that they've got, mm. it's Hernandez, because, as he says... We don't want to make him a martyr. So whereas if I get him, it's another Puerto Rican winning. Hmm. Whereas if it's someone else... Well, Andy yeah. Parker's bursting to volunteer. He's absolutely... Yeah. He, just, he yeah. just wants to shoot him he right won't... up the face. He's, yeah, he's quite... He's quite bloodthirsty, isn't he? Absolutely. It's, of... it's really alarming, some of the stuff he comes out with about what he wants to do to uh, Pepe Miranda. Well, there's a good description where Pete Burns is thinking about... He looks at Parker, who's, who wants to go and do the shooting and he says he'd seen that look before on someone when they landed in Iwo Jima who was like at the front of the thing to start shooting and immediately got shot through the eyes mm. you know it's, so Parker's got that sort of bloodthirst about him uh. but we also learn how Parker got like that in this book yeah, as well yeah, yeah. and it's much the same as how Roger Haviland got the way he got <laughs> it is rather yeah. before he met his plate glass death yeah being nice and naive and then getting kind of yeah, you can't imagine he's ever that nice no, or, or, no, but, well, well, it's certainly it, naive. Yeah, they say that he used to let people off with things. When he was a, a beat copper, he would, he would let people off with the odd misdemeanour. And so he sat down in a bar feeling good about himself one time. And what happens is he gets beaten up by an unknown group of people after that with sawn-off broom handles, mm. which sounds nasty. It, it does. does. And from that day forth, he henced. He would never take another beating. He henced? Did I just say he henced? <laughs> Well, From that day forth, hence forth, he decided that. He, <laughs> That's the one. He would never take another beating and he would never let anyone off with anything as well. So he's never. Burns in this whinges about him just always picking up petty criminals yeah, all the time. He's just also he... a, a reputation for being really harsh on people who've committed incredibly minor crimes. Yeah, so whereas Haviland was actually a bent copper taking, mm. taking bribes and stuff. He's the opposite. He's like, I will get you for every single infraction that you, you, I yeah. could possibly get you for. Because... The more petty, the better, really. I'll, I'll leave the bigger things to other people. Apart from Ben Miranda, who I think seems to be like his sort of great chance to redeem himself to himself almost. It's, and it seems to feel like if he can take down this, this guy, then he'll somehow regain some sort of sense of pride or something like that. I don't know that's yeah. what I get from it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so, yeah. He's just, uh, yeah, he's totally outraged about this uh, this killing, isn't he? And just, I think, the fact that Puerto Rican kind of... Yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of bound up with his, his personal um, intolerance of other people. Mm. Yeah, As in, which he fails to see completely. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's unaware so that he like, is the, you know, the bigot that he is. Yeah, he thinks um, because he can, can be vaguely cordial with... One Puerto Rican fella that he's actually like completely sound and not remotely uh, prejudiced at all. Yeah, he's, and it's a strange character type, but sadly one that you do still come across quite a lot. People who will like call your names and use epithets about race or gender or whatever, and are like, "No, I'm just kidding." Yeah, why? You, why are you getting hurt up about it? You can literally meet these people every day. Still, one of my best friends wears spectacles. You know, yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. It's that sort of thing. Yes. So they, well, they go on kind Twitter of... and the whole place is awash with the fuckers. Um, yeah, excuse my language. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's totally blind to how he is because he has a great rapport with, well, in his eyes, a great rapport with uh, Louis, doesn't he? And yeah, I think he, even he, Louis doesn't kind of mind, doesn't mind him. He, he happily tolerates him, I think, doesn't and he? Then, but after he's been uh, tear gassed accidentally, <laughs> yeah, that's quite good. he goes in and in his kind of panic to try and get this gunk off his face, he kind of snaps out, doesn't yeah, he? He, he, he Louis uses and, an unpleasant racial epithet. But kind of strangely, you can tell at the end, like, um, Parker's quite... Because Louis lets him know how he, you know, that he's not that happy doesn't he he's quite very oh. frosty with him yeah. and Parker's like what the hell's the matter with you you know and he he's kind of in the way that he is 
quite mixed up, actually. He's, he seems to be genuinely kind he of surprised yeah. and he, a bit hurt it, that he can't have the the bants anymore with him. It, and he's he's like, genuinely quite upset that he's upset, uh, Louis. But he, yeah, doesn't but he still really, doesn't really understand. Doesn't understand no, why, yeah. doesn't understand why. But he's just been through something very traumatic, which is... Um, that Hernandez, having volunteered to do the actual solo shooting job, which is to sneak up round the side of the building on a fire escape, one of the gang members alerts Miranda. It all goes horribly wrong, and poor Frankie Hernandez is left bleeding to death through the metal rungs of the fire escape mm -hmm. while everything goes to hell in a handcart. And before too long, there's no way of avoiding saying this, we lose Frankie Hernandez. We've got a dead cop. Our first casualty in the 87th Precinct since Roger Haviland. Well, not casualty, our fatality. Uh. And it's quite a shock, really, yes. because you've had two or three books where he sort of lined him up as part of the squad, given him a particular character, and now he's gone. And it's horrible as well. He's left to bleed to death for ages because mm. they can't get to him for fear of being shot. Well, that's, yeah, because... Um... You know, he probably wouldn't have died if they would have got to him immediately. Absolutely, yeah. think he... it's it's yeah, it's really particularly um, unpleasant. So that when finally they do lure him out with Steve Carella dressed as a priest, and Carella has to dive down some steps to get away while they the marksmen open fire. Actually, it turns out that Parker is the one who fires the fatal bullet, and then just keeps pumping bullets into this, this corpse over and over again. I think that's his way of saying, like, how, did, how dare you kill not just a cop, but my friend, because he, like we were saying, mm. he doesn't understand that Hernandez doesn't think of him as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, he thinks it's banter, and it's, mm. it's a strange thing, and it's, that's his way of dealing with it, is not just to... He goes absolutely nutsoid on him. It's very dramatic. How, how the siege is handle, handled certainly tells the age of the times, because they basically mm. make no attempt to get him out and then just start a military assault yeah, against him. Yeah. Almost immediately, really. Are you coming out? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <The> firing <laughs> tear gas yeah. everywhere, just you know, up in the air, so into their own faces. It's <laughs> kind of, there's no, you know, it's just kind of no... You know, negotiation or kind of... There's no tense, quiet oh. standoff. It's, no, it's, it's like... It's masses of crowds, there's kids, there's reporters, yeah. there's all sorts going on. Yeah, yeah, loads of the general public all around, really close, and then tons of gunfire and bloodshed. And all the while, stuff's going on with the gangs in the background. Mm. Which, Which we've not talked about very much, well, really. We but, haven't, uh, no. Well, you don't want to kind of give the game away there. But, but that's uh, the interesting, that's the sort of the human story in it, isn't it, yeah. as much as anything. And that's interesting because the f the way the police find out where Pepe Miranda actually is, is from a tip-off, which it turns out is related to the gang. Mm. And, and that's, it shows the different gangs' attitudes to life, America, you know, kind of good and, uh, yeah, morality. Good and bad. Mm. The gang's attitude to uh, uh, Miranda as well, you know... It, the differences between the Puerto Ricans in the community. and So that they're not all shown as, as being of the same type, mm. which is what Andy Parker has treated them as. Absolutely. He's, he sort of basically says, everyone in here is the is the thing that created Pepe Miranda, this this thug, this murderer, this... Apart from the guy who makes him nice coffee. Yeah. Who, who's totally <laughs> yeah, found... Yeah, he's lovely. One yeah, of my best friends is dot, dot, dot. <laughs> it's one of that sort of thing, isn't it? It is, yeah. Well, there, there's a good battle over a wooden crate as well, isn't there? Yes. Oh, that, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, uh, well, that's how small these gangs are, is that their actual turf war is, a, is over a crate for seeing what's going on. Mm. It's, not some, it's not like this gang is big street gang, Zip oh. and all these other characters that, he's, that are with him. are all. They're just, there's four or five of them. You know that somewhere in the background there are big street gangs with you know, oh, yeah. proper colours and, and organisation and... Stuff like that. Well, they, it's all very small, very... Well, they do have a couple of, like, eight-year-olds gun-running at one point. <laughs> yeah, there, they do, don't yeah. They? So, um, yeah, they, they're just kind of kids, but on the threshold yeah. of doing terrible That's things, it. really. It's, I think it's, it's cool how um, Bain seems to be going out of his way to show that, like, it's to avoid being caught up in a moral panic about these things, and he's showing that 
a lot of the kids involved in this kind of activity are just normal adolescents and there's peer pressure issues and just things that can prompt people to end up doing terrible things yeah. but they're not essentially terrible, terrible humans people. Yeah, at all. Exactly, yeah. Um, it seems to be... Because even Zip, who it is... He's just frustrated, isn't he? He's yeah. just, he doesn't know how to deal with his emotions. He's just know, a, a well, fact, He's mainly just a tremendously feckless adolescent, really, but he, he sets in motion some some pretty terrible things. Well, at, at one point, China totally talks him out of what he's going to do, and mm. he's kind of, like, really chilled, and then the, the is then the arguments over, over the, the crate. The crate, and, and then he's like, ah, fuck this, I'm going to do it after all. He's just relaxed, and he's gone to go and buy ice cream. Yeah. And then, ah. Everything's happy in the world, and then it's like, well, no, we do need to... Go back to plan the, the, A. Yeah, that sort of being shown up in front of a girl seems like the most important thing in the world when you're 17 or whatever. So, uh, But it's very skillful. You've got all that going on. You've got the stuff with the sailor going on. You've got Andy Parker wandering around. You've got the siege going on. And, yeah, it's it's just, like it's, there's some very skillful yeah. juggling of uh, different threads. There's a, there. very, there's a very good pace to it all. Mm, uh, you know, it's absolutely. Kind of, as there always is, we, there's a good pace to every single one of them, but... It's pretty rare that you ever kind of find yourself bogged down in a thing, thinking, oh, I wonder what's yeah. happening over there. No, just, it just... Um, yeah, no, it... it I it, must it, say, it, one it, of my favourite characters is what from one of the other gangs, from the gang the Royal Guardians, is a character called Lil Killer. Oh, oh yeah. Lil Whose Killer. real name is Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lil Killer. He's 19. Not that little. Has he actually killed somebody? I doubt it very much. I can't, I can't remember. remember. Does he explain? Yeah. I don't think so. It's all very much just kids, isn't it? It oh. is, yeah. Very much so, yeah. So, there we go. I think that's See Them Die summed up or certainly explored. I don't know that we've yeah. summed it up necessarily. But it certainly oh, is. Oh, we're about to sum up now. So. Well, we, we will sum up now. We'll do that. We'll get, <laughs> we'll get the uh, coal-fired uh, into... Kenneth's boiler to get him up oh, and running yeah. for calculations. So I'll, I've uninstalled the Hindi component that I used for calculating <laughs> the scores for the Bollywood oh, film. Okay. So we're back to our usual you know, numbers. Well, we better review it then. And I think I'll start with... We need a recap on the well, scores. Oh. I, let me hand you a printout of Kenneth's... Oh, yeah, uh, well, I refuse that's always to, useful. I refuse to... I don't uh, want to go in, go in cold and end up... Yeah. Uh, right, this is all. Oh, got one each. Or are they... They're different ones. Different ones. Look at this. Oh. Look at well, this. How professional. Yeah. I do. See, I think we, we could recalibrate in order to... Um, Accommodate potential future yeah. highs and lows, as but, it were. But any, anyhow, right, OK. So, yeah, well, that yeah, gives a good yeah. spread. For listeners, you know where Kenneth lives. He's on our blog, hark87podcast.blogspot.co.uk <laughs> or .com. It'll take you there anyway. Hit the Kenneth tab to find out all about Kenneth. Mm. And you can see both the results for the books and also the spin-offs we've done, which we've always added a grade for, of which there's only three what so far. the first one? Star Trek Assignment Earth. Yes, that was the one with Adam. Wow. <laughs> Look at that, high and low. Oof. Yeah, wow. so far the high. It's a stormer. Mm. I'm increasingly realising that I want to mark all of these books at about the same place. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the thing, and but... But we haven't, we, we, but we, as but, it turns yeah. out, we, we actually haven't, so... No, um, well, sometimes, yeah, I've... There's definitely kind of an average score, sort of... Well, you're going to go first, you rarely go oh. first, you rarely go first. <laughs> okay, if, then. Okay. If ever go first. Right, okay, I will say that this is definitely interesting, this one, because of the seeming shift away from precinct matters of forensics, of the footwork of going around asking questions of suspects, this, that and the other. There's no new case here. We drop into into this ongoing thing. We have the gangs. I like all the character work very, very much. I like Jeff Talbot, the sailor. I like the big fat man. He's quite good. And I, <laughs> and it really is a bit of a heart in the mouth thing when you know something's going to go horribly wrong and a young mm. copper by the name of Frankie Hernandez is killed. You can kind of see that coming, Kay, all the way. Yeah, through. well, it's a sense of like, dread. You sort of yeah. know something's up. Yes. And this is something that McBain does very well. In a way, for me, it's not as good as some of the other ones around it and some of the ones coming up. I like it. And actually, when you were talking about it, Steve-O, being like a film, and I started seeing it in those terms and thinking of it like that, I did 
bolster it a little bit in my mind because I used to find the gang stories, the gang based stories, a bit not my favourites out of all the sequences. Oh. Pesky kids. So I'm going to award it a rating of. Oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? Am I going to go? Go with your heart, Paul. Go with your heart. 79. 79. Crikey. Right, okay. Go on then, Steve-O. Well, Count- counter that. Right. Well, yeah. It is, it is tough. Because you just wonder whether... Yeah, because it is quite different. It is quite different. Uh, and I know we were talking about, is there an, a normal to compare it to? But if I just forget about comparing it to something that doesn't exist i.e. normal 87th yes. precinct yeah I enjoy the characters I enjoy what's going on mmm that's a good noise good Tommy Vance noise. I, th- I, I think I shall go quite high in order uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll go about oh, 90 oh 90 oh look at that that was a, a, a big leap Morgan then um, so, yeah, it's a nine out of ten, just about. Yeah, mm-hmm, fair enough. I, I, I really enjoyed rereading it. I, it was one of the ones I've remembered um, mm. really well from from first reading many years ago. I like that it, it takes a, a step away from the precinct to just describe a community. I think that's really cool. And I'm going to weigh in with a, 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 a very respectable eighty-two police shields. Eighty-two. Okay. And Kenneth returns the value. And we round down with Kenneth <laughs> when we're talking about the main episodes. 83. 83 police mm. shields. Where does that place it in that context? Yeah, that it's place, it's it's tie, tie in with... Oh, tie in with a couple of them, actually. Yeah, you see, the, uh, with the with, same with they give the boys a great big hand, killer's wedge, almost, lady killer. There's definitely a bit of a... Um, uh, um, a mood. Well, we're averaging out at 83, I think. At the moment, yeah. <laughs> there's basically... There's, a, there's, there's a lot of room for that to well, change. Well, not, not necessarily average, but there's a there's a common score for what we consider the, yeah. better, the yeah. better stories, but as it were. I, what I'm not going to do is go back over them and, and trace all our individual scores and see how that worked. Oh. But uh, no. that will be interesting. It's, it's not <laughs> normally we're a little bit closer, I think, than this time. Yeah, you see, I purposely went a bit higher in order to drag the score up to what I thought. Uh, <laughs> You're playing the game. Fun. But I, I, I don't think any co- one could deny that a mid eighty score. No, it, it, it deserves to be there. Uh, I, I deliberately pitched it just a tiny bit lower than the con man, just because I've got a bit of a soft spot for that one. But otherwise, yeah, cracking entry in the series. So you're looking back now, you still struggle to think, well, which is my favourite of the ones we've had to date? Oh. Yeah, and knowing that there's so much more to come as well. Yeah, because when I think about all my favourite ones. Yep, we yet to read them. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well. So that's why we need more than more than one hundred. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 who says police shields is out of a hundred? Well, we did. <laughs> yeah, we did actually. But then we also said it was out of ten to start with. So well, we might you know. have to uh, factorise them by point nine or something to drag them all down. <laughs> oh, good lord! <laughs> Sounds. Uh, I don't know if Kenneth can do that. Can, can oh, oh. Well, well, you have oh. to get a new imperial sized cog <laughs> to go in. in. <laughs> well, we've still got plenty to go, haven't we? We've yeah. still, and I'm sure we'll be lower on some as well. I'd imagine so. I, I, I can think of a couple. That are coming up eventually. And there's some that I can think coming up that are nice, but they're not a. They're a bit like. Yeah. They're not a shadow on some of these. Yeah. So. True. Fair enough then. Okay, well, we leave 1960 behind for the next book, and we arrive in, guess what, 1961 for yeah, the excellent. novel we'll Lady. A, oh, oh, go on. I was going to say, it will be such an obvious statement that quite soon when they get a bit more spread out. That's, that's very true, yes. We're sort of leaving the. You know, three a year type mm. pattern away. Away, we're leaving it away. I'm sorry, <laughs> folks. I've said some very strange when, sentences tonight. When does that happen? Then that's kind of we've got a few more years. I think the of, '60s is a bit sort of two on one on two mm. on one on type. So thing. it's the yeah. '70s when they start becoming a yeah, little bit. And by more. the '80s, it's more or less. It's one a year with gaps as well. I mm. think that's it. I mean, they, they, they they're longer by that point, and uh, yeah, much more substantial. And he's also like. Doing other things. I was going to say well. he had his other series going by that point, didn't he? His uh, yeah. Matthew, Matthew Hope. Hope ones. Okay, um, but the next book is Lady, Lady, I Did It. Uh-huh. And we'll be looking at that very soon. 
if you've got any thoughts about See Them Die, if you disagree with us, agree with us, or just want to say nice things, then get in touch on Twitter, et cetera. Until then, I will say goodbye, and I suspect these gentlemen will as well. Uh, goodbye, and I apologise for my terrible accent in reading out Andrew's statement <laughs> before. And fare thee well. Bye. Bye.